I think we are going to start. Um, thank you, everybody, for making the session. Uh, really appreciate you sticking around this long and choosing this session and not the one next door. Uh, my name is Rima Iantel. I am a chief architect uh, responsible for Telco Vertical at Red Hat. And yeah, uh, thank you, Rima. My name is Atanas Atanasov. I'm senior cloud uh, native uh, software engineer at Intel. And yeah, thank you. All right. And today we are going to talk about power optimization. Um, you probably have noticed that sustainability is becoming a hot topic and power optimization is one of the aspects of sustainability and it has two advantage over some other topics that fall under the umbrella of ESG which is environmental, social and governance. It's quantifiable and it can potentially save you money. As my power company tells me every month when it sends me an email saying I haven't saved any money compared to my neighbors. So we are going to address specifically node tuning optimizations in this talk. We are gonna talk about how uh, profiles can be applied to the node to tune power specific settings. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how what Intel had contributed with their Kubernetes power uh, manager uh, improves what you can do. And we're also going to have a short demo all the way at the end. Uh, it's going to be pre-recorded because we're not brave enough to have it live. And uh, for the power optimization for the node, we are only going to talk about what you can do with uh, capabilities that are already present in the CPU. So there is some work happening to do more um, uh, power savings optimizations in a wider context. So for outside of the node, for the whole cluster, for multi-clusters, for the whole domain. And when I say domain, what I mean is in the context of a telco, for instance, a whole RAN network, radio access network or all of 5G core network, right? Uh, but we are going to start small and build. Uh, so uh, in the, on the node, we're going to talk about the capabilities that the CPU exposes to the Linux kernel and what you can do from the Kubernetes layer, which types of constructs you can use to configure the capabilities of the CPU to provide you power optimization. So I want to start with the Tune D. I mentioned profiles that you can apply, and Tune D is a utility that provides you a framework uh, to, uh, to configure certain power optimization settings on a different uh, hardware, right? Uh, so in your node. And it uses profiles that come, some of the profiles come out of the box, so included with the system that you can apply based on the type of workloads you're gonna be running on your system. And those workloads can range from, say, databases or uh, virtualization or you can have a uh, low latency jitter sensitive telco network functions as a workload. And each one of them requires very specific tunings on the system to operate well, even in the context of power optimization. So on the screen here, I have some of the common workloads or the types of common workloads you can see and the types of profiles that you have available out of the box. You can also create custom profiles as well, if you have special workloads. From the CPU capabilities that I mentioned, I want to concentrate on two right now, and this is P states and C states. And when I say P states, it's voltage fre frequency control of the CPU. So you probably know that each CPU has a certain rating for the frequencies, 
and it's a range of frequencies that it can support. And the higher the frequency, the faster you execute instructions on your CPU on each core, and the faster you uh, do some work, some useful work. But at the same time, when you're doing that, the higher the frequency, the more power you're consuming. So uh, on the system level, what's responsible for controlling the P state of the CPU, first of all, you can just leave it to the CPU to decide itself. It's smart enough to decide, OK, I'm seeing this pattern of usage, and I'm going to adjust the frequency. You can also log the frequency. If you know what type of workload you have, you can say, OK, I want my frequency locked at this state and stay there. And what you do, basically, you can have highest frequency, you can lock it there because you have low latency uh, workloads or high performing workloads and you want everything done as quickly as possible. At that point, you're going to be consuming maximum possible power on each core, right? And you can do this tuning per core as well. Um, so what's the, doing it in the Linux kernel is CPU frequency and it's using governors which are predefined and you can run a command uh, and you can see which governors you have available and I'm showing some examples here. Uh, so you can you can choose a governor that saves you power, you can choose a government that gives you performance, right? Or you can find something in the middle as well. And then you have C states. And C states are responsible for how much your CPU is going to rest, sleep, hibernate. Um, it's, uh, the C states are defined in something called um, ACPI, uh, Advanced Configuration and Performance something. <laughs> Sorry, I can't remember exactly too many acronyms, but you can look it up. It's basically open standard, and it tells the operating system what it can do in terms of controls of certain hardware, including how you put certain hardware to sleep, how you configure it, etc. So these C states are defined as part of that uh, open standard. And C states start from C0, which is an active state. And that means your CPU is always ready to do work. No matter whether it has some work to do or it doesn't, it's always ready, right? It's not going to sleep, it's just going to be alert all the time and consuming power. As you move up in C state C1, C2, etc., and how many Cs you support depends on an actual model of the CPU. So as you go up, certain part of the microprocessor can go to sleep. So if there is no uh, activity happening, you can turn off certain functionality on your cores. And actually, it's a bit more complex than that even, but we're not going to go into that level of detail because we have multiple core CPUs, of course, and we ha have hyper-threading. And some of it also can play a part, but not in our particular case, all right? But if you're interested, look it up. It's pretty fascinating how it works. Okay, so we have C states, and you can also leave it up to the CPU to decide which C state to be in, or you can actively, proactively control it, and you can dynamically reconfigure it for a particular C state if you know what your workload is and what its needs are. So if you know you're running workloads that cannot withstand any sort of latency, you are never going to put your CPU to sleep. You're going to stay at C0. But if you know that you have workload that can handle latency because the deeper the sleep, same as us, right? The deeper you sleep, the longer it takes you to wake up. Same for CPU. Um, so yeah, you, you control it from that point of view, knowing what your workload is. There's also something that's called uncore frequency, and that covers everything on the CPU that's not a core, like QPI bus and uh, controllers, etc. Uh, and Atanas uh, can tell us a little bit more about it, uh, because it's something that's coming in the future. It's not available for control right now. Right. So the Encore on processor, it has also its own frequency. Basically, it's responsible also if you imagine about a processor today, 
uh, it also consists of a mesh uh, which connects the cores between each other and there are cache agents there are multiple components which are um, basically can be controlled uh, through this frequency the frequency is important basically for data movement uh, it, uh, if you have a workload which needs to move a lot of data from one core to another it might be a good idea to tweak this frequency that's why uh, we we are integrating that this capability in the, uh, into Power Manager. Uh, we will have it in our next release. Currently, it's still under development, but with our next release, you can use that. All right. Um, so let's look at what Kubernetes uh, contribution is to this whole uh, power savings picture. So we have, and I'm actually going to start at the bottom because I can. Uh, so performance profile controller is something that's responsible for taking your definition of what you want to look, uh, you, you know, to look like from the power perspective and from some other perspectives. You can uh, tune other things outside of the power optimization, but it takes that and it distributes the relevant bits to the other uh, things that I list here. So kubelet, which is I hope you know is an agent that runs on every node and it's responsible for the life cycle of the uh, containers running on the node and it has some components that can control uh, what the CPU uh, assignments and layout look like to the container. It can, uh, using CPU manager and topology manager, it can, uh, you know, assign specific cores and, uh, you know, specific placement for your workload. So that's where Kubelet plays its role. Then you have cluster node tuning operator, and that is what maintains certain tuning uh, uh, rules. And those tuning rules apply a lot of different top, a lot of different things again, including some of the power tunings. And the last one, we have machine config operator, which controls certain configurations on the operating system. And here I have a diagram. It's a pretty high level. So, you know, if we don't have enough time to dig d deeper into that, but what you do is you start with your performance profile and you define what you want your specific node performance profile to look like. Uh, the tuning operator uh, extracts relevant information from this configuration and uh, based on that from each <laughs> relevant other configurations that you have defined, uh, basically, you define which nodes you want to apply this to, what it is, the, you know, what are the settings that you want to apply, etc. Um, you uh, so no tuning operator to, takes all that information and basically uh, applies it to the node. On the node, you have a kubelet running already, and the kubelet uh, communicates some of that information to the relevant bits underneath, including the operating system directly on the node. And then you have, for the performance optimization specific parameters, you have a TuneD running, a TuneD daemon running on the node because the TuneD service is running uh, as part of your, I think, no tuning operator uh, space. So basically, you take uh, it passes the parameters to the daemon, and daemon is then applies those parameters directly to your um, through your drivers to your hardware, right? And then it automatically happens that your CPU then can adjust the P states and C states, and as we said, encore frequencies is coming up uh, soon. So uh, I mentioned no tuning operator already several times, and these are some of the things it can control. So you can turn on and off CPUs using no tuning operator. You can uh, select specific governors per core or per group of cores, and you can granular, granularly control the uh, configurations per pod 
that are running on the node. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail for that. So if you want to permanently turn off CPUs, uh, you can do that. Right now, it's a rebootable event, so you can specify which CPUs you want to turn off. Obviously, it's going to save you power because the turn uh, offline CPUs are not consuming any power, but uh, it means that if you want to turn them back on, you have to reboot the node, right? So not every uh, type of deployment can handle it. Where we see people are using it right now is some of our customers are over-provisioning their hardware in expectations of future growth. And basically, they end up with too many uh, CPUs and too many CPU cores on their machines that are sitting there idle, consuming power. So, uh, you know, they can plan in advance and turn off those cores when they're doing deployments. And then they have their own uh, ways of managing when they have to uh, reboot. Anyway, so this is how you do it uh, through the performance profile, you can offline the CPU and, uh, you know, it's just a configuration change. Um, it's supposed to become hot pluggable at some point. So uh, watch the space, it's coming up. And this is something that's very valuable, especially for the, our telco customers, because they're running some workloads that are uh, latency sensitive alongside the workloads that are not. So if you're looking at the um, workload, it, we're talking about like data plane workload versus a control plane workload. And uh, up till recently, uh, us, when, uh, you know, we provided uh, best practices to our customers, our default performance profile was geared toward the low latency workloads until we realized a lot of the workloads are not really that sensitive and we're consuming too much power because we are setting C0 uh, and highest like turbo frequency on every core. So what we can do is be using the workload hints and pod annotations, we can say, okay, this workload is low, uh, uh, low latency, it needs to be performing. So it needs to be, uh, you know, everything needs to be set for performance. And the rest of my workloads are not that sensitive. I want to set them for power savings. So now you can do that uh, through the same model that I described earlier. And now I'm going to hand off to Atanas, who's going to talk about the Kubernetes Power Manager. Thank you. Right, uh, so uh, I will start with why we looked at uh, implementing a power manager for Kubernetes. So if you think about Kubernetes as a software layer and the whole idea of Kubernetes is to abstract away the machine for applications and there is a natural gap in that aspect. So basically uh, we as Intel and uh, other vendors uh, basically providing machinery uh, with, with the processors and, and different kind of capabilities uh, which can allow uh, basically to configure uh, the power utilization for uh, or to, to have certain tweaks on the power utilization for a workload. And basically, um, this is one of the benefits when using Power Manager, why we implemented the Power Manager. Uh, we, we try to bridge the gap between Kubernetes, applications, and the platform. <clears throat> and this was the main idea. So um, there are a bunch of capabilities which are coming inside the Power Manager, and uh, some of them are targeted exactly to this example, what you heard uh, before. We have high priority applications, let's imagine, and low priority applications. And we want somehow to assign more power, more, uh, higher frequencies, basically to the higher priority applications, which are mission critical. And for the other applications, which we can run uh, without issues, uh, if, if they are running with lower frequency, we want to assign them to a power saving profile, if we have such one. So uh, our architecture, uh, you see, uh, is basically structured as an operator and consists of several controllers. 
from left to right, uh, we start first, uh, the user can configure the system through a configuration file or a configuration YAML, uh, which is a custom resource. And it, it's, there is a controller which processes this configuration. And in the configuration, we have um, all the profiles what have to be made available on the nodes, on the compute nodes. So this is being processed and uh, basically the operator, the controller for the configuration brings up a so-called node agent uh, and it deploys the profiles what we need, what we configured in the configuration. Um, after that, basically the user can, can use those profiles in the workloads and uh, they can be several types. We heard the similar to, to TuneD. Uh, we provide a performance profile. We have a power saving profile and something in between. Balanced performance, balanced power. Uh, that, that's the whole idea. <clears throat> uh, next slide. This is a summary of the capabilities uh, of the uh, whole software. So uh, basically, the, on the left, we see uh, the node agent is a utility, a daemon set which runs on, every, or runs on the nodes which were configured to use the power profiles. And it uh, uses uh, the C state capabilities on the processors to basically uh, put cores in and out of sleep. Uh, we have additional capabilities, uh, for example, to point out uh, time, time of day controller. You could imagine, for example, uh, in Intel world, world, it can happen that the load during a certain period of time during the day is not that high. And you might want to configure your profile based on the time of day period. Uh, so we, we can do that with a time of day configuration. <clears throat> so we have uh, capabilities to control C states, P states, uh, we have also capabilities to select different pools of cores where to assign those uh, C and P states according to the nature of the applications, the, if they are high priority applications or applications which are lower priority and we can put in a shared pool. Um, how does it look, uh, the, the, how does the whole configuration look like? Uh, we see uh, some examples of the different profiles. So specifying a profile is quite straightforward. Uh, this is basically a custom resource definition. Um, on the top left, you see an example of a performance profile. So you can configure that by, the, by selecting the performance profile. And uh, you can also tweak uh, a range of frequency for those profiles, the min max range of frequency. So this, is, this kind of CRD is understood by the controller and deployed automatically on the corresponding node agents. Time of day capability, we mentioned that already. So you might have this case where you want to control the active time of day. Uh, and uh, basically this is another CRD and you see how this can, can be configured in that example. Um, let's look in the whole kind of situation in a more practical example. Uh, we, we did uh, deployment uh, of an actual workload together with, with the power manager in, in OpenShift environment. Uh, we picked uh, a microservice workload uh, called uh, uh, Dead Star Bench Hotel Reservation. If you are not familiar with that workload, basically it's uh, some sort of hotel reservation system consisting of, it's a classical three-tier architecture, so you have some uh, front-end and then you have uh, some microservices doing the business logic, and you have the last year, which are databases or caches. So we have, we have picked this kind of deployment, and uh, we tried to, to uh, play around with, uh, with the power manager. So what are the steps actually to use uh, the power manager together with uh, TuneD in an OpenShift environment? It can be summarized in quite simple four steps. So first we needed to configure the TuneD software package on OpenShift. Uh, after that, uh, we followed the deployment uh, recipe provided by the power manager. Uh, we instantiated the power profiles, which we need for, for certain set of applications. And at the end, we deployed the workload. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, here you see our TuneD configuration to use the Power Manager. There are some uh, important things to point out. Uh, we mentioned that we need P states. You see in, 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 in the TuneD profile uh, configuration, we need to make sure that the P states are actually enabled on the system. You can specify that in the bootloader option. Uh, further, uh, also we configured current, uh, we configured further options which are required to run um, the power manager in the current implementation. Then uh, we instantiated two profiles. We had a shared pool profile, which is for our lower priority workloads. Uh, and you see those lower priority workloads will run in the range of 1,000 to 1,500 megahertz. So we put them on less frequency. Uh, this is our power saving profile, and we have a performance profile for more important workloads, which is in the range of 330, uh, 3,300 3, and 37,000. In terms of after instantiating uh, those ZRDs with the profiles, we can use them in the actual pods for the workloads. Um, uh, you could do that in, in the resource section where we introduced uh, the power.intel.com balance power, for example, or uh, the performance uh, profiles. Uh, what you see there, uh, it's also uh, those, uh, uh, basically the core count, what you introduce, uh, what you pick for your workload has to be matched. So we had, for example, in the performance profile case, we had a high priority workload which we wanted to put in a guaranteed quality of service. And uh, to make Power Manager work and uh, pick basically a pool of cores uh, which, and assign to it a performance profile, we have to match uh, this kind of core count for it. And now uh, I will switch to a short demo from my colleague Lukas, who is unfortunately not here. He recorded something for us to see that in action. Hi, my name is Lukasz Danielczuk. I'm a cloud native software engineer at Intel and I'd like to demo the Kubernetes Power Manager on an OpenShift platform. We will start by verifying that the Power Manager and the required Tune profile are applied. We also have a share profile and performance profile already created. Note that the performance profile is currently using the performance governor and the share profile is currently using the power safe governor. We also have the hotel reservation from Dead Star Bench deployed. Currently, no pod is requesting any power profile, so the role are in the shared pool. To verify this, we can also log into the node and check that all the CPUs are in the power save mode as per shared profile. We have a version of hotel reservation ready that already requests the performance profiles. Finally, we can apply the changes. Now we can verify that CPUs requested by those pods are in the performance pool. And this is it for this quick demo. Thank you. Yeah, this, this was our demo for the Power Manager integration in OpenShift environment. Uh, 
Yep, that was it for us. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to ask. I think there's some microphones over the ends, or you can just come up. Uh, Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, my question is, did you uh, observe any changes in the lifespan of the device by changing frequencies and playing around with that? In, sorry, in what device? The, the CPUs, did they live longer or shorter or did oh. that have any effect? This hasn't been around long enough for us to really <laughs> notice. Okay, all right. <laughs> But uh, yeah, once it goes into production, uh, so this is all uh, still used in like lab prototypes. Uh, we have I haven't seen any like large deployments that are actually utilizing this. Uh, we'll have you know ask us again uh, maybe next year in Paris. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, can I add a follow-up question? Sure. Um, which is, um, have you tried making uh, your clusters or your nodes carbon aware that way so that? Um, you um, trigger that not only by the time of day, which I heard uh, you could do, but also by like the carbon intensity, if that goes up, so, um, to so that's your coming frequencies up. goes down. Okay, that's coming so, up. So that's future work. Uh, I don't know if you heard about Kepler. Yes. Uh, so the plan is to basically make the, this functionality potentially connected to uh, to like what Kepler uh, metrics are collected and make some decisions based on that. And when I was talking about uh, more cluster-wide or uh, multi-cluster-wide decisions, uh, that would all be working together. So using Kepler and maybe connecting it to like uh, autoscalers and one of the types of autoscalers could be based on frequency autoscaler. So basically you would uh, figure out what is the sweet spot for each core to work at, right? At which fre like frequency um, C state balance for types of workloads and place the workloads based on those decisions. So each CPU in each node is basically on, at that sweet spot if possible. Yeah, so. just, just to add, uh, at Inter we work also on, on a, another framework called intent-driven orchestration, which could fit also nicely in that kind of question. So where you could have maybe an intent to, to control the cluster based on, on, on yeah, uh, carbon footprint, as an example, that you desire a certain level of carbon footprint and then the, the whole intent-driven framework will tweak the components under the hood so that you keep basically that level what you specified. Thank you very much. All right, we have time for one very quick question. <laughs> I'm not sure whether that's good. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, my question is, do you have some numbers on how much energy you can actually save using those measurements because they're probably quite uh, minor? Yeah, how, how much numbers. do you have some numbers on how much energy you can actually save using those um, measures? So, yeah, we, we have some measurements uh, with B controls in Delco space, which were done recently, they, they are actually quite good numbers, uh, uh, quite, which we published recently as Intel uh, for, for a Telco workloads in the World Mobile Congress, where they were savings up to 30% uh, in power, so which is quite quite impressive in in, in Europe, Europe space where power is expensive. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for coming and sticking around.